Well, let's talk about menopause. You know, I'm amazed it's taken us this long into a podcast to get to it because it's such an important issue. It plays such a huge role in women's health, whether it be dementia, sarcopenia, osteopenia, you name it. But I don't think I've done a dedicated podcast where we look at the effects of menopause on ASCVD. We've certainly danced around it today and we've shown our hands a little bit here, which is this is an accelerator of risk. Can you say a little bit more about why? Is there anything more to it than simply the loss of estradiol leading to an increase in LDL? And if so, what's the actual mechanism by which that's happening? You know, we started off the program talking about hormone levels. So estrogen levels start dropping during perimenopause. And perimenopause can actually last several years before menopause. Menopause is one of those things you don't really know it's happened until it's after it's happened because it is officially sort of diagnosed when you haven't had a menstrual cycle for 12 months, which usually happens around age 51. But earlier onset of menopause before the age of 45 or before the age of 40 is associated with increased cardiovascular risk. You know, with the primary estrogen of women of reproductive age, estradiol drops dramatically. And then there's the changes to estrone E1, which is the weakest type of estrogen formed in the adrenal glands and other adipose tissues. By the way, Erin, am I remembering my biochemistry correctly? Estrone exists in three variants, or it can be converted into 4-hydroxy, 8-hydroxy, and 16-hydroxy, or 2, 4, and 16-hydroxy uh, estrone. Does that ring a bell at all? And the reason I only bring it up is I feel like one of those was more thought to be involved in the creation of breast cancer. I'm not sure I can speak on that. I'm mostly familiar with just the, the three major subtypes, the E2 estradiol, the E1, and the E3. Among estrone types, I apologize, I don't know that data, except that it's no worries. Okay. It's a very weak type of estrogen. And so essentially, you know, women after menopause really have very low levels of estrogen. In fact, women have lower after menopause have lower levels of estrogen than men do. Men have higher estrogen levels because of they have much higher testosterone levels and they have increased peripheral conversion of testosterone to estradiol. So actually men have higher estradiol levels than women after menopause. Do you know my other favorite stat? That's a great one, by the way. The other favorite stat of mine is that even pre-menopause, women have higher testosterone than estrogen if you actually convert the units to the same units. I think some people think after menopause, the ovaries are just not active anymore. But that's not true, actually. After menopause, the ovaries continue. They just don't make estradiol. But they continue to produce androstenone and testosterone. So they keep making androgens really up to significant amounts until age 80. And these androgens are what get converted in fat and muscle tissue into estrone. So I mentioned this because a lot of my research has been about sex hormone levels after menopause. And we've previously shown that postmenopausal women who have higher androgen levels, who have higher testosterone to estrogen ratios, you know, had a more male-like pattern, you know, they had greater risk of developing ASCVD and heart failure over the next 12 years. And this was even after we adjusted for risk factors like blood pressure and lipids and diabetes. And we did a number of studies, this was all in the MESA study, the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, but we also showed that women with higher androgens had more coronary artery calcium progression, they had worse endothelial reactivity, they had increase in concentric remodeling, you know, all this adverse cardiovascular phenotype. And also, as I mentioned, we started out talking about PCOS earlier, but in PCOS, the riskier phenotype is the hyperandrogenism state and you know, testosterone and androstenone and higher LH levels in PCOS as a marker PCOS. So getting back to menopause, a lot of things happen related to these hormonal changes. You have more visceral fat deposition in the abdomen and more insulin resistance. And this leads to this dyslipidemia pattern of increased triglycerides, increased LDL and decreased HDL. There's more endothelial dysfunction, increased blood pressure, increased sympathetic tone. So where a lot of cardiovascular risk in women is more linear with aging. So for the most part, you know, blood pressure and diabetes risk tends to be more of an aging effect rather than an ovary effect. Lipids is one thing that really seems to be an ovary effect that we do see, you know, relatively acute changes in the lipid panel following the final menstrual period with this rise in total cholesterol and LDL. I think we alluded to earlier that it's maybe one of the reasons that women tend to have 
risk a little bit later in life and after menopause is because they tend to have this more dyslipidemia pattern a little bit later in life. Now, this pattern, this increased risk, you know, had led this whole body of work about, well, if these changes are harmful, maybe giving menopause hormone therapy would be beneficial. And of course, you know, we did this for years. My mother used to be on hormone therapy. This is all, you know, well before the Women's Health Initiative study, because we just felt that, you know, oh, well, you must give these hormones back. There are favorable and unfavorable changes that we see with hormone therapy, especially this combined therapy. So some of the favorable therapy changes, if you do give women estrogen, you will lower their LDL and it can increase the HDL and estrogen can have... And are you talking about oral estrogen or topical estrogen? Systemic estrogen, which is oral and to some degree transdermal. Vaginal estrogens don't have much systemic absorption. So they're a really good option for women. You know, I'll talk about which women to use hormone therapy in, but for women who just have the genital urinary symptoms, even in women with cardiovascular disease or history of stroke, or you can use vaginal estrogens safely. And sometimes I think there's this concern about using them in high-risk women, but you can use the vaginal estrogen. So I'm really talking about oral estrogens here. They dilate the blood vessels through a nitric oxide effect which you know, may be all cardioprotective, but keep in mind, estrogens also have unfavorable properties. So we know that estrogens can increase CRP. So women of higher CRP levels and estrogens are prothrombotic. I mean, this is why there is some increased risk with oral contraceptives, particularly in women who are older of, of reproductive age and combined with smoking and also during pregnancy, that estrogens can increase prothrombin, decrease antithrombin-3. And we also talked about The estrogen effects with triglycerides, same thing with oral contraceptives, which have higher estrogen levels, hormone therapy, all could increase triglycerides. So in higher risk women, particularly those that are farther out from the menopause transition or those with established cardiovascular disease, these adverse changes, you know, may outweigh any favorable benefits. And that's why probably the Women's Health Initiative, who had the mean age of 63, most of these women were quite far from the menopause transition. And the Women's Health Initiative also used an oral conjugated equine estrogen with progestin formulation that we saw, you know, an increased risk, including a twofold increased risk of venous thromboembolism. So this is why, you know, the guidelines all changed and we don't recommend hormone therapy for the sole purpose of cardiovascular disease prevention because we have many other things we can use for prevention like statins. But, you know, the pendulum doesn't have to swing so far away that if you look at sub-analyses of these trials of women that were closer to the menopause transition, younger women, we didn't see this excess harm. And so while a lot of women are quite symptomatic at menopause, you know, vasomotor symptoms can be very disabling for many women with the hot flashes and the brain fog. In fact, vasomotor symptoms in them themselves when frequent or persistent are associated with cardiovascular risk. And so for symptomatic women who are under the age of 60 or within 10 years of menopause who have symptomatic menopause, menopausal hot flashes or night sweats, you know, consider a hormone therapy Women who go through menopause early, if they don't have other contraindications, menopausal hormone therapy is recommended to at least the natural age of menopause or age 51. But generally, we're not recommending it if a woman's more than 10 years out from menopause or over age 65. This is where the increased risks are emerging in these trials. And we want to avoid oral estrogens in women with a history of cardiovascular disease, blood clots, high triglycerides, gallbladder disease, or prior breast or intermetrial cancer particularly the oral estrogens, there's probably a little bit less risk with transdermal estrogens, which are still systemic, but they don't have the first pass effect. But I, you know, very work really closely with our menopause clinic as part of doing a cardiovascular risk assessment prior to use of menopausal hormone therapy. So when risk is uncertain, you know, I get a coronary calcium score to make sure that they don't have any calcified plaque. Their score is zero. I feel pretty comfortable with using hormone therapy in them for treatment of their vasomotor symptoms. But if they have significant atherosclerotic disease, you know, I tend to not recommend it. And again, if they're only having genital urinary symptoms, topical estrogen's fine. You know, the risk it really probably depends on a lot of factors. It depends on when you start the hormone replacement, you know, your age at initiation, how many years you've been since menopause, your menopause age, how long you take the therapy, the duration, the type of therapy, the dose, and the route of administration. 
And probably your incoming health. The other thing I'm hearing here, Aaron, is this is another reason for young women, women who are in their 30s, for whom menopause isn't even on the radar, this is another reason to be as healthy as possible and to do as much preventative work as possible. Because if for no other reason, it gives you more optionality at menopause. My calculus on this is looking at a few things. And, you know, obviously quality of life is one, bone health is another, muscle mass, brain health is a huge one. So I'm kind of looking at it as heart health is not even on the radar. Because to your point, we have so many better tools to reduce the risk of ASCVD that we don't need to rely on estradiol as one of those tools. It's basically a pea shooter in a bazooka fight when we have big, big guns to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So while we're really asking of HRT is to not hurt somebody while we let it do its bazooka-like work, which is going to be on the brain, bone health, vasomotor symptoms, eventually vaginal atrophy and things like that, for which we don't have alternatives. And so to your point, the difference between a 50-year-old woman who shows up with a beautiful CTA that's crystal clear, where we're going to have no ambiguity about this line of treatment, versus a woman who shows up with a worrisome CTA, and yeah, maybe even if we go to transdermal, there's going to be more hesitation, there's going to be more concern, and maybe that slight increase in risk, if it exists, is something we now have to weigh in the balance. Again, it all comes back, in my mind, listening to you, to prevention is the key. It's just start early and be aggressive, and all you do is give yourself more options later in life. Yeah, absolutely. The risk is in women with established cardiovascular disease. So trying to prevent that plaque you know, in the first place, you know, if there's no atherosclerosis, then the, the vasodilatory effects and the, the lowering of LDL you know, may be helpful in preventing the initiation of atherosclerosis. But you know, a woman who already has disease and the slight increase in inflammatory markers and a prothrombotic effect, you know, may tip them over to having a vascular event. So all in favorable about improving cardiovascular health earlier in life. You know, the really how we live the first half of our lives really influences our freedom from morbidity and mortality the second half of our lives. Uh-huh.